Okay, it's December 19, 2014, and we'll get started with a prayer. Heavenly Family, thank you for your countless blessings. Thank you so much that we're entering into the Sabbath now and have the opportunity to really rest. And thank you so much that we are in Hanukkah as well and that we get to actually learn about history that we've lost and many other blessings also for just making it possible for Teresa and I to be on the meeting tonight Mm -hmm. and to be able to hear these wonderful, familiar voices. (laughs) So thank you so much, Heavenly Family. And I just want to thank you for all the other blessings that are taking place lately, you know, those that we are directly experiencing here at the property and also that the other branches are experiencing too. So Heavenly Family, thank you so much for all your blessings. And Sister, please guide our conversation tonight in whatever way it should be guided in order for the most blessings to be received because we know that you are ever eager and even anxious to bless us abundantly. So thank you so much. Thank you, Father and Mother, in the name of your children, Brad, she and she. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I know that we're going to be... um, reading in the Maccabees tonight. So yeah, I did find my hard copy. I don't know if you got my text, but I did find um, a little red book, and it has first and second Maccabees in it. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's... Most, most apocryphas contain first and second Maccabees, and then uh-huh. some also contain third and fourth. And... Just over the past couple nights, I've been able to go through and read uh, however much of First Maccabees again. Just you know, just when I wake up and am <laughs> stoking the fire, I'll have time to read a little bit. I sent out the link with the studies on YouTube that we had last year, and I think it'd be really great for everyone to go back over those. I myself would love to go back over them. Just hadn't really, have not had an opportunity yet uh, in no small part, you know, which is in no small part due to the fact that we don't have electricity or internet and different things like that. But, yeah, I don't know. If anyone did uh, go over them, there may be some input that you may have in this this meeting, but I guess before before going through Maccabees, um, is it okay with everyone if we share a little bit more about our experience here so far? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, there's a couple of things that have just been such a huge blessing. We wanted to pass it along. Um, there have been so many object lessons that have been impressed upon my mind over the past week, I guess, specifically. Even today, another one. But primarily what it's been is that, you know, through this whole experience, it's been a constant effort to stay warm enough. And that means different things. It means um, walking out in snow um, anywhere from one to three and a half feet deep and forging a path in order to get to that tree that you can see that's still standing, but it's obviously dead, so it's not buried under a bunch of snow. You know, so you can cut it down and then haul it back and cut it up into firewood 
or in some cases it means going somewhere and purchasing some wood and hauling it back. And largely it means constantly keeping an eye on the fire to make sure that it doesn't go too low or go out so that the temperature doesn't drop. And that means waking up every, you know, hour and a half or two hours in our case in the night to make sure that we feed the fire and on and on and on. You know, it's a constant awareness and effort to stay warm, to have fire And it's like, what a beautiful picture, what a perfect symbol for the Holy Spirit, fire. And how in order to keep that fire kindled in us, it too requires a constant, diligent effort, an awareness, uh, you know. And just as the fire is so necessary for life and is really a life-giving source. Exactly. That is wisdom, our sister, you know, Mm -hmm. the life giver. Even one other thing that I don't even know if I've mentioned to you yet, honey, in regard to the whole fire aspect is the fact that, you know, we're also learning about the different types of wood that are in this area specifically and how, you know, certain woods are going to give you a hotter heat, but it may only last for a short time, or it may be a hot heat that lasts for a long time. It may give you good cold. It may give you lousy cold. You know, there's different types of wood. And it made me think of how Doug put it, um, in regard to uh, ourselves being living sacrifices and how the wood for the fire, if I'm remembering correctly, that we are to be that wood for the fire. It's in the the ending section of the Lord's Supper from the table to the altar and back part two, where he's giving the different types and antitypes Mm -hmm. of the ceremonial law. And in there, he gives one application of the fire continually burning. And then he talked about how, as priests, we are to offer, you know, to keep stoking the fire with wood. And that it, that is a symbol of us offering ourselves. Like the priest was offering a symbol of himself. Because wood, you know, a tree represents a leader you know, a Mm -hmm. person, leadership, and offering that wood upon the fire, constantly offering ourselves to be consumed by the spirit, the fire. So, um, as, did you have more you want to say on that? Yeah, there's uh, just one of the, the first lessons that came to my mind when we were doing this sort of work on the property, just kind of like the basic necessities, was actually um, one day when we had to go and chop down some trees and haul them over uh, to where the yurt is. And so we just, you know, trying to figure out, okay, you know, we would chop down a tree and it was just too big. We can't pull the whole thing. And we didn't want to have to chop it all up into the sizes that we were going to place into the wood stove uh, because it's, you know, basically just going to be so many more trips going back and forth. So it's like, okay, so let's cut it into, you know. Four foot long sections. Yeah, whatever. four foot long. Four or five or, even. Or five and some even six with the skinnier tree that we mm-hmm. did that one day. And so we're doing these logs and you know basically hauling that and I for the first one I remember uh, having it uh, where I was pulling it with part of it on the ground and part of it in my arms and then I would change different positions and I would I, I did you know many different positions just to kind of Get a feel for it. Yeah, get a feel for, okay, what's the best way to do this? And also 
to keep changing it up so that I don't end up with, you know, a pulled muscle or anything like that, just to give a more equal wear and tear on my body, I guess. And so, you know, at one point, pulling this big tree, basically, it was one of the, it was the first one that we brought over, actually, and it was a bit longer. And as I was pulling it, I just could not help but think of Christ and how he had to bear his own cross and literally pull it and all the different lessons that go with, you know, taking up our cross and following him and, and how, you know, I was thinking how, man, Christ was a carpenter and carpentry back then was a lot different than carpentry today. And it would not surprise me at all if there were times where he was just out there hauling a tree from the forest And it's like, you know, just thinking of how human his experience really was and his own sacrifice and his own suffering and how even just having something that reminds us of that is in itself such a huge blessing. And so it's just kind of like, you know, being there, having something that you're actively engaged in that has so many deep and rich and beautiful lessons. And uh, I guess there's still more that we both have to say on on these different things. Um, maybe I'll, I'll mention something else first before uh, Teresa has some more object lessons that have been coming to her mind over the past few days, I guess, especially. And, but I just wanted to mention in the overall sense how, you know, Ellen White talks about John the Baptist and John the Baptist's experience in the wilderness and how he was there in a, a situation that most people would consider to be quite um, trying and difficult and, you know, surrounded by not the most beautiful place. But to John, it was a beautiful place. And it was a place of learning. And it was, you know, it was really a wonderful experience for him. And it was the best place for him to learn the message that our Heavenly Family had for him to bear. And he could obtain the best education in that environment. She says that, you know, both he and Christ did not learn in the pharisaical schools or the rabbinical schools, but they learned in nature and that they learned from reading the scriptures themselves and being in trying circumstances and doing hard manual labor and different things like that. And, um, and then the other example that Ellen White gives, which I, you know, Teresa and I were reading something relating to this a little while ago. It's actually John the Revelator. And when he was on the Isle of Patmos, you know, he was there to be, you know, the place was to be to him a prison. But it ended up being a place where, you know, he's looking and seeing all these jagged rocks and he's seen the sky and he's seen uh, all these different things that are reminding him. Ellen White talked about how he looked at the jagged rocks and it reminded him of the rocky Mount Sinai and, you know, all these different things. He goes into some detail describing how his environment affected him and how it was a really trying place but how there was so much beauty in it for him and it really just blessed him to be there. And so just in overall sense, it's like, you know, I know that, you know, some, maybe even some here on the call might be thinking, man, are Trent and Teresa crazy? (laughs) You know, going out here and, you know, having to deal with, somewhat harsh winter conditions and, you know, even 
you know, there's other people, even the guy who came by to get the, uh, or to talk to us about firewood today, he just told us that we're absolutely crazy. And uh, another guy mentioned to us, he was just like, wow, what a time to pitch tents or to pitch camp. And it was just like, you know, it seems like, wow, you know, why are we in circumstances that would typically be considered trying? But it's such a blessing. Mm -hmm. It really, truly is. And Teresa has more of those particular blessings to mention now, I guess. But I just wanted to give an overall perspective of living with this type of lifestyle, with harder circumstances and, you know, just dealing with hard work and different things like that, how it really is a blessing and how we can see more and more clearly all the time how this property is going to be really, in so many ways, an ideal place for the training of a wave chief ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. Um, But yeah, so just briefly or quickly on some of the other things that have really been impressed upon my mind lately through all this, you know, there's a thing about the fire and how it's necessary to preserve life so that you don't freeze to death, basically, um, in the reality of the situation. But then you have also the reality of the spiritual, where the fire, the Holy Spirit, is so necessary. Without that, there is no life spiritually either. And then I thought, you know what? Living this way with no electricity and no running water... These object lessons are so much, um, so much more easily impressed upon the mind because, you know, the other thing is obviously so vital for life is water, and once again another symbol of the Holy Spirit, and how important, you know, good water is, you know, the pure truth, pure spirit, bringing pure truth. And, um, well, I could, that, that pretty well sums that up for that part. But then the, the other thing that kind of was impressed upon me just today, I was, I don't know, I might, might have been cooking something. I was doing something with the wood stove, and Trent had just come in from being outside doing something, and I just said, nature was God's first Bible. Mm. And he smiled and he says, what object lesson have you got this time, honey? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, you know, we have been so busy, just busy, 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 with, you know, cutting wood, hauling wood, getting water, hauling wood, hauling water, melting snow down into water so that we can use that for bathing and for washing clothes and, you know, on and on and on. And it's like, during all of that, our Heavenly Family has been able to speak to us. We've actually been spending time in their word with them, I mean, now, a person could do all that and not spend any time in the Word or with our Heavenly Family. They could be totally having their mind focused just on worldly things. But in our experience here, you know, we've just been looking at the at the lessons in nature and constantly talking to our Heavenly Family and, you know, asking day by day, you know, what should we do today? what's the most important thing to do today, just like we always do, but it's, you know, the tasks have been different in this experience versus when we were staying with Alice. So um, it was just so comforting and beautiful that with everything that we've been doing, 
being out here in nature, we are also drinking in the word from that experience. Yeah, it's like while while we haven't had as much time to be active in the books because I haven't had as much time to write and we haven't had as much time to read. We've had some time to read, but not as much. And it's like, hey, you know, this has been a blessing to be able to commune with our Heavenly Family in, you know, through nature and just simply, you know, seriously just being out there with an open sky and at night here, by the way, this, from this property, more than anywhere that I've ever been or anywhere that Teresa has ever been, we can see the stars so clearly. It is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, there's something about it that really... Um, Draws you close yeah, to our heavenly family. Totally. Yep, so, anyway, um, yeah, those are just some of the beautiful object lessons that have been impressed upon us and really felt like it would be good to share with everyone. And even though you may not be in the same circumstances as we are, you can still have your mind on these object lessons, just the fact that you're able to walk into your house and flip a switch and you have electricity, you, know, you have light illuminating the room and you have, you know, a stove that you can just turn a dial and you're going to bake your food or cook it on the top of the stove top. And these different things, they can still point your mind to the contrast of, you know, what it was like years ago when there wasn't even that option and how um, and how those lessons have really been kind of lost sight of with all these, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, these... Advancements? Yeah, advancements, luxuries, these, these things of ease, you know, that make everything so much easier. But yet, man, you can really lose a lot in the lessons learned. But then one last thing I wanted to say about nature being God's first Bible. That was one of the things I said to Trent. I was like, you know, before anything was written, and as far as, you know, we can tell probably Enoch was the first one, or at least the only one that we know of, that wrote something that you would call scripture. But even if, you know, you're going to go to the time of Moses, I mean, before the scriptures were written, what did people do? They didn't have something to sit down and read. So they still had to commune with our Heavenly Family. And how did they do that? You know, they weren't able to commune face-to-face any longer after expelled from Eden. But they had nature, and they had, you know, prayer, of course, yes, and the angels took the prayers to our Heavenly Family. But anyway, so, yeah, beauties of nature, lessons learned and all that. That's wonderful. (laughs) Well, you know, Sister White talks about just the blessings of country living. And, you know, she didn't, she wasn't discussing what you're going through, but just, you know, being out in nature, I mean, that's, of course, they're going to use the things that we're familiar with in our everyday life to, um, like in the temple service and things like the the fire and and things. I mean, I'm sure that they're... um, there's so many lessons and so many things yeah, that we, we just look for them. Something I wanted to mention, too, in regard to, you know, okay, there's different types of country living. And actually, it's kind of interesting because the type of country living that Ellen White talked about is actually, in some ways, a lot more like the experience that we're going through 
than a lot of people who feel, uh, you know, like they're living in the country today, which perhaps... Mm, yeah. But the, what I mean with that is that, you know, today w- there's a fancy name for the type of country living that Ellen White was talking about, and that's called off-grid living. <laughs> Just because mm-hmm. back then, any country living is totally off the grid, you know? And it was, you know, the type of thing where people had to become... You know, you're living in the country in Ellen White's day. You're self-sustaining. You have a lot of hard work to do. And that's just it, you know. And today, I mean, we even, even with off-grid living, I mean, you can still have all of the uh, modern conveniences if you want them and if you have the money. But it's just like, you know what, it's really... We're called to live simple lives. Christ himself lived a simple life. And, yeah, it's it's really, you know, there's just so many blessings with living in the country. We have chickens. <laughs> awesome. Chickens <laughs> laying eggs. Beautiful. Yeah, see, that's... Oh, we so look forward to all of that. Having chickens and goats, different things like that. This is really... Oh, man, we can see... Yeah, Trent's going to go stoke the the fire. Um, We can really see a beautiful future here for the ministry and just even just ministering to the local area through agriculture and how that's going to be the foot in the door for this area. Now, you know, medical missionary may be part of that in this area too, but for this region, it seems like they're really going to be interested in the whole agriculture, whether that's produce or whether that's eggs or whether that's goat milk. I mean, yeah, for sure. It's going to be a huge part of the ministry here. And uh, it's going to be so wonderful to have all those animals and just the interaction with nature there. And you know what? That is going to provide such a beautiful um, environment for children because they're going to love interacting with the animals and it's going to give them something productive to do while they're learning these object lessons through nature. Mm-hmm. It's just fantastic. Yeah, it really is. You know, and I'm thinking about the contrast of uh, between that and the Greek idea of physical training, which was through the gymnasium. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I was reading up on that because, you know, in the magazines it talked about that was one of the things that they adopted right away. And, you know, the contrast is is really extreme because, you know, in, in this type of physical activity that you're talking about, Um, It's just part of your everyday life. And yes, you get physically fit and more healthy through it. But the object isn't to just make your body look beautiful and to provide entertainment for for people as they watch, you know, people compete against each other. And, And there aren't long hours of, you know, sitting around in a pool with uh, philosophers, you know, just uh, philosophizing, vain, vain philosophizing at that. And, you know, you can see that in our culture. It's just permeated our culture. And it's just a completely different way of looking at that. And, mm-hmm. yes, it's good to get in phys- good physical condition, uh, but it's just a different approach. And it's completely different from what our Heavenly Family have in mind for us. 
Totally. And you know what? It even seems like a poor use of time almost mm-hmm. <laughs> to sit on a piece of exercise equipment. Now that yeah. I've been out here, I'm like, I'm thinking, man, there's so much to do. I don't have time to get on an elliptical walker, you know? Yeah. I, I need to be out here shoveling snow or hauling wood or whatever the case may be. And that is such a complete body exercise mm-hmm. that you can't help but get in shape. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, what you said about the children taking care of the animals and that will give them something to do and they'll learn lessons about our heavenly family and all kinds of things and and it'll give them in good physical condition but contrast that with the way most people live in the cities and like um you know a lot of the people that i'm around they're just running themselves ragged they get their kids involved in some sport you know um and you know the idea i think in a lot of cases is they they want to give them something to do that's better than you know, the alternative of just hanging out and doing nothing or sitting around, you know, playing video games or getting involved in drugs or whatever. But, um, you know, they just uh, run themselves ragged, taking them to practices and games, and then they get them all involved in the whole idea of competition and who's better and somebody's feeling great about themselves, but the losers, you know, are feeling pretty bad about themselves and, you know, and it's even, you know, I can see it in our Adventist school, and people just don't, they don't understand what's wrong with that. And it's its just, it's the mindset of it that's totally. so wrong. And, and, you know, if we were living in the country, like you said, we wouldn't have time for that kind of stuff. There's just so much to do. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely no time. I mean... When you have to put forth the effort to get fuel to stay warm or to, you know, haul in water or whatever, yeah, there's no time for those other uh, those other things. Yeah. This Norman, I'll, I'll tell you about my little country living story today. Okay, cool. It's real, real country living. Um of course, Teresa, you know where we live out here. It's a the glade, and it's all shell rock, and it's impossible to, to dig a hole or find a place to plant anything unless you build the raised beds, which I've done, of course. But I've yeah. been looking for a place to plant all my raspberries that I've had in pots for the last year. So I got to thinking that between these um, glade rocks, there are cracks where the the dirt gets trapped and the leaves and everything and and trees will pop up out of it. So today I got out there and scraped off the two inches of soil that's on top of all of these rocks and washed it off and found a place that where a, a split was because there was a, a, a roots from a tree in there that I had to dig out. And anyway, sure enough, I found a big split and I'm going to plant all my raspberries there, about 30 or 40 of them. But awesome. anyway, while I was out there on top of this rock, the thought that came to my mind, which I hadn't even thought about this until Trent was talking about what he was talking about. And I was standing on this rock, and I thought about the song about the wise man that built his house upon a rock. Yeah. And, of course, that made me think about Jesus. So. Hello? There's little things like that that you, you do out in the country that bring you around to... The truth, really. Amen. Yeah, you uh, wouldn't really be able to get the same picture on a concrete sidewalk, would you? No. <laughs> Not hardly. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. I, yeah, I really look forward to having more of you guys up here and us all being able to continually learn these lessons together and mm-hmm. and also maybe we could grow some raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and Norman can build a fabulous chicken house. 
It's a fancy chicken app. That's <laughs> awesome. I have to say that I know it, um, originally the intention was to do the Maccabee story of, of the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah tonight and tomorrow. But I have so enjoyed just spending time with you guys and going over, you know, these lessons that our Heavenly Family has been teaching us as individuals and, you know, sharing the blessing amongst one another. And it's been really nice. I've really missed you guys. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I second that. I We and really miss you. We miss you. you. Yeah, and that includes you know, every single person on here tonight, even though many of you haven't said much after you said hello, my mind has been thinking about each one of you. I mean, Leroy, Rollin, my dad, my mom, you know, Carolyn, Tim, everybody, Carolyn Norman, of course, as well. Yeah, my mind's been going to each one of you individually and just thinking how wonderful it will be one day for us to all be together in the same room at the same time. Mm-hmm. Amen. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. And on on the uh, Maccabees thing again, um, and yeah, we probably won't get into reading it tonight just because there's, you know, we've been on for quite some time already, and... You know, it just, uh, you know, might be better. We won't be able to go too far into it if we were to start, and we probably wouldn't be able to get far enough to get kind of a complete thought or a complete lesson. Um, But I do just want to mention, you know, as I mentioned a little earlier, how I've been just going through reading first Maccabees again. And just how it's really struck me this time reading it, which I think it's only my second time, it's really struck me how it's such, this whole history of what took place between the days of guys like Zechariah and Haggai and Christ's first advent, you know, that space in between, the history there is so, so important for so many reasons. It really shows, you know, understanding that history will give us a gold mine of truth. It really will. And it also, that history shows us how certain ideas started to come into Judaism, which have still remained till today, both in Judaism and Christianity, which ideas aren't necessarily good ideas, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, it's, it's just definitely, definitely a blessing to go back and get a better idea of the history. Like, imagine, imagine not having any of the parts of the Bible that talk about the 70-year activity in Babylon and the return after. Having all the information around that, but having nothing that deals with the 70 years captivity and the return from Babylon. It would just be such a big part of the puzzle that's missing, and it would make everything else harder to understand because you don't quite have the continuity between one thing and the other. And it's the same with this. It's just very, very important to see, okay, you know, so this is what happened after the second temple was built, and okay, what happened? What what really did the Greeks do that affected the Jews so much? And how did different Jews respond and what were the different groups of Judaism that emerged from that and you know there's so much and then there's just the lessons contained in the books of Maccabees 
themselves, you know, the examples that are given to us of martyrs and of people who um, stood true to principle regardless of what anyone, you know, even if it's the highest king in the world, <laughs> you know, regardless of what they say, the stain true to principle. You know, there's a lot there. Mm-hmm. Well, I um, have listened to the three videos from last year, and um, I just really encourage everybody to listen to those because um, it just really puts everything, kind of ties everything together, and you know, there's just so many. There's so much truth that came out in all that, and that still is is coming and will be coming, I'm sure. But you know, the thing that really struck me was that you know I could see how um, how the, the building of the second temple is tied in with this so closely. You know, with what happened with the Maccabees and their rebuilding the um, altar, you know, and getting the, the service reinstituted and all that. And and then also with the Exodus and how that's just so tied in with what's going on right now. And um, how everything is being or has been restored that was restored back at the time of the, of the Maccabees when they you know, we're able to have temple services again. You know, like like the um, the ancient writings that were destroyed. You know, the writings are being restored, and with the apocryphal writings and and the pseudepigraphal writings, and um, you know, getting rid of the the Greek way of life, the Greek understanding, with all the understanding that we've gotten over the last almost two years. You know, about um, you know, corporeality and different issues and, you know, and, and, and um, you know, the priesthood, you know, the, what's going on in the outer court with the daily and all the different um, services, you know, being all the, you know, all the different feast days being um, revived and everything. And, and then the thing that you said that just really struck me is that this is the gospel. The temple service is the gospel. So it just gives us so much encouragement that that's what they're restoring right now. Just, Amen. It, I don't know. I was just really amazed by this particular teaching. Yeah, you know, it's. I have not been able... Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever listened to the recording of those meetings. The last I heard was when we actually went through it. But I remember being blown away with what our Heavenly Family was showing in the history of the Maccabees and how it relates antitypically to both the taking away and the restoration of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And it really, you know, it's just one type among many for the present work. And, you know, there's there's a lot more involved with it. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure that there's going to be, the more we learn about the temple service, the more we will see the significance of the Maccabean typology because that is what it revolves around. And especially over the past however many months since really getting into the Silver Trumpet articles, how we've been so pointed to that sacrificial service and the priesthood and the temple. It's, you know, this whole thing, it's so, so deals with what, was going on in the with the Maccabean types. I, I mean, Mattathias, the father of Judas Maccabeus and Jonathan, his brother, and uh, Simeon, you know, 
all of those brothers, you know, Mattathias, he was a priest. And they were all, they were all, you know, of the lineage of priests. And really, I mean, the, the priests back then did a lot more than we typically think of priests doing. I mean, these guys were also warriors. Um, but it's, the whole thing revolves around priestly activity and the restoration of the temple and its services. Well, there certainly is and has been a warfare against that. Hey, there's something that I wanted to mention for you guys to look up. Uh, two things, actually. See what information you can find on this. Uh, one thing is, um, I guess it's in it's in First Maccabees chapter two. It mentions it says, in those days, this is at the beginning. It says, in those days, Mattathias, son of John, son of Simeon, a priest of the family of Jeorib, moved from Jerusalem and settled in Modain. The, the thing that I want people to look up is what information can we find about the family of Jeorib? Um, now, that's one way of pronouncing that name. There are others. And in looking it up, you'll find it. There's, a, you know, at least three or four different... Uh, versions of that name that's referring to the same thing. And what I was able to find so far is that in the days of David, when the priestly courses were set, the family of Jeorib had the, you know, were the first course of priests. But I want to see, you know, if you guys can find out anything more, like, you know, who was Jerib the son of, and stuff like that. Um, so that's one thing. And then also, if someone could look up the meaning of the word Maccabee, because these different sons of Mattathias had different uh, surnames, like, you know, his five sons, one is John, who is named Gadi, or Gadi. Then is Simon, called Thasi. Then Judas, called Maccabeus. Eleazar, called Avoran. And Jonathan, called Apphus. And so, they had these different uh, names that were given to them. And it would be interesting to find out what does the word Maccabee mean in and of itself? So I just wanted to mention that, and I'll see if, you know, there's a possibility I might be able to look some of that up more too, but just because of our situation right now, might not be able to do that as much. So I'm hoping maybe some of you guys could look up things related to that. Sure. Awesome, thanks. And then maybe tomorrow when we get into it more, those different aspects I'm sure will, will um, you know, bear their own relevance. Well, who would right. like to well, pray? That is if we're finished. Mm -hmm. Yes. Teresa, do you want to pray? Oh, sorry. I thought you said that you wanted to pray. So I know. I said, who wants to pray? Oh. Sure, I can pray. Okay. Thank you so much, Heavenly Family. This has been such a blessing. We want to thank you for the Sabbath during this time of Hanukkah, Feast of Dedication. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we've had to... Uh, to just fellowship with our friends and family that 
we've been missing and thank you for enabling us to keep a signal this whole time out here. So that's such a blessing as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the object lessons you're teaching us and for the work you're doing in each person's life here. Bind us all together in love, Heavenly Family, and uh, just bring us closer and closer and closer to you. I'm just looking forward to your work being finished Mm -hmm. so that we can really, truly find peace and joy in our home in the garden that you'll be placing on the earth made new. Uh, Please enable us, Heavenly Family, to hasten that day. So thank you, Father and Mother, for giving us your son and daughter, Branch, he, that we have the opportunity to talk to you, that they intercede for us. And thank you so much for your love and your great sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Amen.